Um, professor Holmes Ralston, who's speaking today, is University Distinguished Professor and Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at the Colorado State University. He has written very numerous books and papers, and his latest book, due out actually on September the 27th, is A New Environmental Ethics, The Next Millennium for Life on Earth. Professor Ralston has been called the father of environmental philosophy, though I understand that he would, he now prefers to be called the grandfather of the I don't know that I prefer to be called <laughs> the I just noticed that's happened. Okay. Well, yeah, so he's, uh, it's happened that he's now the grandfather. Yeah, and when it comes out, great grandfather, <laughs> I'm not accepting any more speaking English. <laughs> Well, anyway, whichever it is, um, it's indeed an honor to have him address us today. His talk today is on the future of environmental ethics, which indeed can be seen as a talk on the future of the planet Earth. So, Professor Ralston. Uh, thank you. I've been in Singapore several days and have found it's a place with uh, most cordial hospitality. My first time in Singapore, though I've traveled in Asia a good deal, and so I was uh, glad to come here. I uh, spoke uh, Tuesday in sort of another of my fields. I sort of wear two hats. One is a environmental conservation, environmental ethics hat, and the other is I work in philosophy of biology with some interest in uh, science and religion issues, and I spoke uh, about that on Tuesday, but I didn't at that time uh, pass around a copy of the book on which I based that talk. Maybe you could uh, circulate that some uh, during this talk, and as uh, Cecilia said, uh, if you can wait uh, a week, I have a new book in environmental ethics. Uh, come on in and please come down front. I have a new book in environmental ethics. Uh, I have to think up the title. They changed it to time or two. It's called uh, A New Environmental Ethic, Life on Earth in the New Millennium. And it's uh, going to be released September the 27th. I guess I could say the talk today is uh, summarizes uh, much of what is in that book. Uh, for those of you who just came in, I'm Holmes Ralston, a philosopher at Colorado State University. I've been officially retired a couple of years. i got a good deal of gray hair, but I have <coughs> been fortunate enough to be able to stay uh, somewhat active in the field. What well, I want to think about the future of environmental ethics, and <clears throat> we might begin with a group, a well-known group called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And they say we have a stark warning human activity, putting such a strain on the earth that you can't any longer take for granted that earth will sustain future generations. That's a pretty stark warning. We had a once almost president of the United States, uh, won the Nobel Prize, Al Gore, for his concern about uh, global warming. Uh, John Kerry, his wife, again a presidential candidate, he has a book on, he and his wife have a book on contemporary environmentalists. Uh, President Obama makes a lot of noises, at least, about environmental conservation, but we're wondering uh, how good his actions are going to be. Now, Paul Hawken, Australian, says that environmentalism is the largest movement in the world. When you add up all of the uh, 
various small groups and some big groups with environmental concern. I, I know, 10, 12 years ago, went to the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio, uh, largest conference at that time, uh, with more heads of state that was surpassed slightly, but at another environmental conference at Copenhagen uh, last year. And we've had in the United States, famously, the BP oil spill, a big report on that was just released yesterday, a year later, the sort of largest environmental disaster in American history. Well, what am I saying? I'm saying, in essence, that it looks like environment, at least, is uh, in the future. I think we may be at what I call one of the ruptures of history. Uh, what could I mean by that? Well, once upon a time, Christopher Columbus arrived in the New World, 1492. Well, nothing much changed instantly, but the general idea is that for Native Americans, who had been in North America, well, 20, 30,000 years, life was going radically to change when the Europeans discovered the New World. It was a rupture in their history. In European history, when Galileo gave us a new vision of Earth circulating the sun, or when Darwin gave us a new account of evolutionary history, it sort of radically changed uh, intellectual life thereafter. Now, I think environmentalism now is putting us at a rupture of history. Well, let's spend a little time thinking about how that might be so, and one way of asking about it is are, are we going to have a managed planet? Uh, will we have the, if you like, the end of nature? Uh, here's a uh, Scientific American issue some years back. Let's uh, get it back right. Uh, managing planet Earth. Is that what's going to happen? And in that issue they say uh, there are two main questions humans face. What kind of planet do we want? What kind of planet can we get? Is this the future of Earth? Uh, managed by environmental managers, people who know how to fix it the way we want it. I think uh, since the arrival of humans, humans have always had some technologies. You might say their technologies have been inside the biosphere, but some say, well, going to switch. And in the future, there'll be some biosphere, but it's going to be inside the technosphere. There's a French philosopher, uh, Henri Bergson, says, well, if you can imagine looking thousands of years uh, in the future, looking back, they're not going to remember the First World War, the Second World War, the Vietnam War. They're going to remember the technological innovations that sort of began with the steam engine and came on to 
power of petroleum, uh, the, the power of uh, uh, nuclear power, the, the power to manage the planet. Right? That's going to be a shift like the shift from the Bronze Age to the Stone Age. It's going to uh, define our age, that humans become the planetary managers. We're going to live, some say, in a post-natural world. Uh, there'll be nature, yes, but it's going to be virtual nature because it appears to be nature, but it's managed nature. Bill McKibben, a friend of mine, says, character of the world is changing because there's no such thing as nature anymore. Uh, Michael Soleil, another friend of mine, great environmentalist, yes, but he laments uh, by the end of this century, what are you going to have? Uh, the landscape is going to have, yes, some remnants, uh, some reintroduced natives, a lot of partly or completely engineered species, and exotic species. See? Uh, so much so that the term natural will disappear from our vocabulary. quite a prediction. Daniel Botkin, good ecologist, California ecologist. Nature's going to be the nature that we make. We can make it whatever we want it to be. Barry Calicut, good environmental philosopher. Nature as other than humans is over. Well, yes, humans will mix with nature, an organic system. need a new concept of nature that mixes humans in with it. And yes, we do need to pay some attention to the ecological merits of our technologies. But Paul Kreutzen, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry on atmospheric chemistry, we are entering the Anthropocene. Pleistocene is gone. The ancient geological ages. The Pliocene is gone. Here on out, it's the Anthropocene. Uh, two authors, uh, human-dominated land ecosystems bigger than wild ecosystems. That might not surprise you. Uh, let's think a little further. Maybe this does. Human agriculture, plowing, uh, bulldozers, mining, move more dirt than the natural processes of rock uplift and erosion. Beginning to sound like nature is over. But let's not move too fast. Uh, a Swedish study said if you look at nature, uh, half of it's terrestrial nature, half of it is a little disturbed. But then they turned around and said, well, yes, but a lot of that is Arctic and boreal and Sahara desert. desert. So if you look at the sort of habitable nature, uh, only about a fourth of it, 27%, is little disturbed. Partially disturbed, uh, a quarter or a third, if you look at sort of habitable parts of nature. Human-dominated landscapes, uh, again, about a quarter or about a third, if you look at habitable landscapes. 
Well, you can mix these numbers more than one way. You can say it looks bad. Dominated or partially disturbed is uh, about three quarters of the terrestrial landscape, but the same numbers can be added up to say, well, little disturbed or only partially disturbed is about two-thirds of the surface of Earth. Uh, the same authors a minute ago who found humans activity widespread did have to turn around and say, well, actually, on Earth, uh, leaving out Antarctica and leaving out Europe, most of the settled continents are still between one-third and one-fourth wilderness. So it might be too soon to say that nature is over. Maybe we could think of it this way, if you remember your uh, geometry. The circle differs from an ellipse, and the ellipse has two foci. Maybe we could think of Earth as having one focus, which is nature, one focus, which is culture, and much of the landscape in other parts of the world is still wild. Much of the landscape, as uh, those in Singapore know as well as anyone else, is almost entirely urban. And much of the landscape is a hybrid landscape, where nature and culture both control what takes place on the landscape. We have a great river in my country called the Colorado River. We have a uh, water authority on our campus that says the Colorado River is a virtual river. What does she mean by that? She means, you know, it looks like a river. It still flows in the channels it once did, but it's highly managed. It's really part of the plumbing system. Colorado agriculture in Colorado cities. Well, in the West, the United States, we have a great park, Yellowstone National Park. Do, do we want to think of it as being virtual? Do we uh, want to think of the Rocky Mountains near which I live as being virtual in nature? want to say, I think you might want to say, that all you have in the nation of Singapore is virtual nature, right? But you probably don't want to say that all you have in Southeast Asia will be virtual nature. Singapore people may want it access to real nature in nations nearby. Managed nature, at the end of nature, are we facing in the future the end of nature? Well, some will say yes, because we're facing global warming. And it's too hot to handle. We can't do anything with it. And certainly it's upsetting the natural world. It's upsetting air, water, soil. It's upsetting forests, plants, animals. It's upsetting shorelines, ocean currents. Uh, people are saying the seasons come earlier or later. It's upsetting agricultural patterns, property values international relations. It's uh, threatening British security, John Houghton says, more than global terrorists. John Houghton, another friend of mine, is a climatologist. The British were startled when he said this in a prominent newspaper article. 
global warming threatens Singapore more than global terrorists? Think about that. I'd like to hear an answer in the question and answer section. It's a perfect mar moral storm, says Steve Gardner because it mixes up everything in strange ways. You've got natural technological uncertainties, you've got global and local interactions, you've got difficult choices to make scientifically, politically, socially. The Chinese think one way, the Indians think another, the Singaporeans may think yet another way. future generations have something at stake. Uh, maybe global warming affects some more than others. There are concerns about what counts as merit, justice, benevolence, uh, voluntary, involuntary risk. It may be that what we do now doesn't take effect for 30, 30 years or uh, it's kind of a situation in which doing things that we've always thought to be good are accumulating into things that are bad. Uh, so it's easy to deny it, it's easy to put things off, to deceive yourself. There's all kinds of subtle ways of sort of talking ourselves out of the problem. Uh, you get individual interest, national interest at odds with global interest. It's what Garrett Hardin once called the tragedy of the common where an individual does one thing and it adds up to a bad thing if everybody does it. Taken at the pitch. Different people have different powers. Uh, some can do a lot, some can do almost nothing. Does Singapore have much power to act in solving these problems of global warming? Many people think of themselves as being powerless. I was uh, two weeks ago in Denmark. The Den Danish people say, well, you know, why should we uh, go to the trouble to care about global warming when everything hangs on what China does, what the United States does? I can't imagine a single poor people thinking they might be making senseless sacrifices. Generally, we've got structures in business, structures in politics that sort of force us into certain disruptive behavior patterns. Are we only to be gloomy about this? Well, we've done some things that sometimes seem to work. We've got some good overfishing agreements. We've got some good whaling agreements. We've got the Law of the Sea, the Convention on Trade in International Endangered Species has been uh, rather successful, I think. Uh, some people think the Montreal Protocol has been the most successful international agreement in human history. Right? So let's not say nothing is possible, but it does seem to be hard to get, you can sort so of get uh, hydrofluorocarbons in focus for the Montreal Protocol, but it's hard to get CO2 emissions into similar immediate focus. Looks like they're going to be cascading shifts. Looks like can't always predict the results, and it looks like maybe even when we can predict the results, uh, we can't do that much about it. 
whether we have hope now about the future with this problem that seems too hot to handle is going to depend a lot on what we think about human nature. What we think about our capacity to face an unprecedented crisis. So, we're going to have to ask about ourselves. Are we a unique species that can solve these problems? Uh, and then some say, well, yes, but the uh, problem is uh, Pleistocene appetites. Well, you might say, you know, it's a long ways to the Pleistocene, that's cold weather. There's no cold weather in Singapore. But maybe in your genetic heritage, uh, these things still uh, remain. Uh, the idea we'll say more about in a minute is that we, we live in a world of engines and gears great power, but we still have ancient appetites. We still have muscle and blood appetites. Well, some would say, oh yes, but if we evolved in natural history, then we ought to love nature, shouldn't we? Biofeed, in Wilson's word. But others say, no, uh, biofeed is weak beside our desires to transform our environment. Uh, man, the genius of being human is to make artifacts, to rebuild your environment. Uh, muscle and blood appetites, uh, Pleistocene appetites. Do you like sweets? Sure. Do you like fat? Sure. Do you like salt? Sure. Do you like sex? Sure. Why? Because it took all the sweets, fats, salt, sex you could get to make it through the winter in Pleistocene. And even where the weather wasn't cold, it still took right? great struggle to have enough. Right? And so we are prone to get fat when we can. Sweets, fats, salt. To have more children than we need to have. We're prone to overconsumption. We're prone to want to push back limits because that's always what we've been trying to do and we've sort of built into our way of thinking that life is going to get better. You have a hope for abundance, you, you should work toward obtaining it. That's what an economist says is rational. To give more goods and services that people want. Well, uh, we have a right to self-development. Most people would say, well, yeah, we do. Do we have a right to self-realization? Do we have a right to abundance? We do. Everybody has a right to abundance. Well, when you get these kind of drives that are sort of built into our genes and endorsed by our moral codes, right, there gets to be escalating consumption. Everybody seeks their own good, there's escalating consumption. If everybody is a missionary and goes off and seeks everybody else's good, still going to be escalating consumption. We're wondering if humans are well equipped to deal with the kind of problems we now face. Uh, we know how to work in family, village, tribe, nation. Uh, 
make agriculture, industry, work, uh, law, profession, schools, temples, churches, but, but none of them are exactly oriented for these concerns for far off descendants and uh, distant races. So many are asking whether our genes that kind of once enabled our adapted fit, whether even our moral systems that once pushed us to want abundance and maybe to share our abundance, that they may prove maladaptive in the future. Well, some then say, well, the most you can do is enlighten self-interest on these scales. You're going to have to find a more comprehensive account of human welfare. You're going to have to get nations working together about their collective interest. That's what's happened in the European Union in my lifetime work together where they used to just fight each other all the time. Well, I want to ask you, Singapore, with surrounding nations, right? Is there a movement, parallel movement, for these nations to work together to solve their collective problems? The Montreal Protocol, we said, has been quite successful. And we've got some 150 international agreements that deal with conserving the environments. And we do lots of things that don't seem to have much relationship to our ancient appetites. I flew across the Atlantic to the Pacific in a jet plane. I flew across the Atlantic 10 days before that. Uh, we can build the internet. I was using it earlier today. We can decode our genome. We can designate world biosphere reserves. Uh, there's lots of things seem where we seem to be able to do things that we never had to do in the past. Uh, we largely think that a man should marry one woman. And if I were to say, well, in Pleistocene times, a man typically had uh, two or three wives. Uh, the women in this audience wouldn't probably wouldn't be persuaded of that because we did that in the Pleistocene. We ought to do that uh, today. In Pleistocene times, you probably never heard of human rights. The cave men and the ancient uh, people, they had, I'm sure, a certain sense of uh, treating each other fairly, but the concept of rights is a relatively modern concept. It didn't exist in Pleistocene time. Are, are we kind of going to say, well, we have to do and can only do what we are programmed to do by our sort of biological legacy? See, I, I don't want this idea that we sort of have built-in biological tendencies to, to get to be an alibi for continuing our excesses. Well, let's think about sustainable development. That's what we want, we might say. But now we want to maybe wonder, well, is that the right way to phrase it in the future? Future is a great future of sustainable development. 150 nations have said so. 130 of the largest corporations have said, yes, that's what we want. Sustainable development. Good thing. Americans can do it their way. People in Singapore can do it their way. The Indians can do it their way. The Chinese can do it their way. And yet, everybody has to have it as a general orienting policy, 
we can make certain agreements about how the Australians will do this, the Canadians will do that. But we have certain aspirations and thresholds. Right? That sounds like sustainable development is a, a good thing. Different countries can do it different ways. But are we saying, well, yes, but what this means is that the economy is prior. And yes, you have to be concerned about the environment, but you can do anything to the environment just as long as it doesn't threaten the growing, sustainable economy. Or do we uh, maybe want to switch that around and say, no, it really ought to be the other way around. The environment ought to be prior. And yes, you need an economy, but you need to work out an economy within quality of life in a quality environment. Well, the language, uh, preferred language, seems to be uh, sustainable development. The United Nations, it takes first priority. <coughs> but if you turn around and ask about sustainable biosphere, the ecologists say that ought to take first priority. problem is those escalating appetites all over again. A series of graphs here, just don't try to read the detail on the graphs, just, uh, just sort of watch 1950. Gross domestic product. This kind of takes a right angle turn in 1950. Rivers Dam, look at 1950, and then dam a river, you're going to use water. Singapore had not probably dammed many rivers, but I bet water use in Singapore looks about like this. Irrigated lands, uh, fertilizer consumption, look at 1950. Uh, motor vehicles. 1950 just radically escalates energy use generally, inanimate energy use. Kind of angle turns there again in 1950, doesn't it? Right. What are we saying? We're saying that we have these appetites for more and more and more, and now we've passed the age of muscle and blood, we have engines and gears right, to fulfill these appetites. World population. Look at 1950. Radical change. Are we able to handle this kind of And within this escalating picture that we have just been seeing in this series of graphs, uh, we have to notice the rich grow richer and the poor grow poor. In the 20th century, the differences between the rich countries and the poor countries have escalated dramatically. <clears throat> Back in 1820, it was about three to one. 1950, when we saw a lot of those changes, uh, 35 to one. 1973, 44 to one, 72 to one, and the last time for which I could get firm figures, but many say now the differences between rich countries and the poor countries is a uh, hundred to one. 
three people in the world own more wealth than everybody in some 40 of the least developed countries added up together. The richest 2% own more than half of global household wealth. And the parents of many in this room will be in this category. Okay, now you say, well, uh, we've got an answer to that. Uh, it's environmental justice. We have to speak the truth to power. Speak out about this great inequality. Uh, let's think of somebody who did, uh, Joe Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winner. Chief economist at the World Bank. Uh, when I was at the World Bank, I saw firsthand the devastating effect that development can have on the poor. And at the IMF, there, there seemed to be ideology, bad economics, veiling special interest. He continues, I was chief economist in a great economic crisis. Watch the IMF and the U.S. Treasury Department, and I was appalled at the self-defense of vested interests. Lord Acton, English uh, scholar, centuries too back, absolute power corrupts Absolutely. It looks like we've still got Pleistocene appetites driving the rich and the poor as well. Or if we uh, turn to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, don't really have good theory linking ecological diversity to ecosystem dynamics, but we're pretty sure that the poor are most vulnerable to ecosystem degradation. People on Earth have entwined destinies. End of nature? No. People on Earth will forever have entwined destinies. Well, now you may say, uh, well, it's good that We've got biodiversity. We can uh, solve our problems often exploiting the biodiversity. And now, are we going to say then, well, yes, we need to save biodiversity because it's good for me or because uh, in some sense it's good of its kind. Ed Wilson says, the web of life on Earth is a kind of miracle we've been given. But the Millennium Ecosystem says, yes, and we're putting it to extinction. With extinction rates accelerated a thousand times in many places. And you may say, oh, well, uh, there's natural extinction. That's been going on for centuries, hasn't it? Natural extinction is of kind that permits re-speciation. Human-caused extinctions don't permit re-speciation. They shut down the extinction process. So we save what's good of it for us. We save what's good of its kind. Again, the United Nations seems, uh, in some of its moods at least, uh, put humans at the center. Put humans at the center. A couple of economists who seem humane. Uh, most important request we can give looking to the future is more concern for human rights. So, if you've got environmental policy, it just can never be at the expense of the poor. You can't be proud of a policy that 
preserves the environment if the poor bear the cost. Well, that seems right in a certain sense. Uh, we're not proud of a policy that says the rich should win and the poor lose. Uh, Joe Stiglitz was fired from his job because of the protest of that. Yeah, but let's watch what the World Health Commission says, World Health Organization, Commission on the Environment. Priority given to human health raises a dilemma if health conflicts with the environment. Priority for human survival is first order principle. Respect for nature is a second order principle. Obey it, yes, but always put people first. Sounds humane? It is humane? It means no tigers. It means no rhinos. But you can always sacrifice a tiger sanctuary uh, in order to feed more people. If you're going to preserve, you're going to have to conserve, you're going to have to set aside reserves. And we have some 600 major reserves for wildlife in some 80 nations. And all of them could be sacrificed, would be sacrificed, if we always gave first priority to humans, to hungry humans. Well, Michael Rosenzweig says, no, no, no. You can have win-win ecology. You can figure out a way for Earth species to survive and humans to prosper. On our campus, we have uh, signs around all over the place that say, recycle, everyone wins. And now the idea is, that's right. Environmental problems are all like that. If you do it right in harmony with nature, People win, the rhinos win, and the tigers win. The right? best you can do is enlighten self-interest, those Pleistocene appetites, especially in a free market democracy. So what? You'll have ecotourism. You'll make money off the elephants. I'm expecting next week uh, to go and see the, the Komodo dragon. So they'll make money take that trip. Okay, so save wildlife of where it, where it can make money for you, but always prefer people. Always prefer Americans, first order. Singapore comes second. might say, that's outrageous. Right? Who would say that? What's he doing saying that, standing up in front of that? Well, here's President George Bush. First things first are the people who live in America. Canadians, Indians, right? They can say, they can say uh, that's outrageous. But I say, well, if people say always put people first, and elephants and tigers and rhinos, they come second. That too is morally naive. First things first are people. Uh, tigers always second, and uh, sequoia trees uh, sort of says you non-humans can live only if you're worth more alive than dead. See, I think there's something morally naive about humans saying, uh, we come first and everything else is out there relative to its utility, even if we have nice ways of saying it. I'm thinking if we look into the future, we head into a future that caused the seventh mass extinction. We're
we're not going to be proud of that, are we? Humans are going to win if they change their goals to get our values right. I grew up in the U.S. South. My ancestors had slaves. I grew up in uh, the United States in time when women's liberation was an active movement. Now you might say my slave owner ancestors lost. They lost the war, they lost their slaves, and yet we welcome the introduction of blacks into American life. Atlanta, seat in the south, is southern mayor, so is Birmingham. The president of the United States is black although his ancestors were never U.S. slaves. And likewise with the coming of women, women have become prominent in American life. I'm sure they are in Singaporean life. Maybe that sometimes cost a, a man a job he would like to have. But don't we welcome that? Okay, now I'm saying if we can welcome into the picture an appreciation for others than humans, just like we have welcomed different kinds of humans, if we can be inclusive in our ethic, uh, we will win. And a critic may say, well, yes, but you're moving a goalpost to win. Now, you can't, if you're playing soccer, you can't cheat by moving the goalpost. But then again, you can't win philosophically if the goalposts are in the wrong place. Okay. World Charter for Nature, a uh, UN document, it's every form of life is unique. We need that. We need an earth ethics. We need a sense of citizenship in Singapore. We need a sense of residence on the planet. The college is a logic of a home, of being at home. Well, citizens are at home in their nations. But citizenship isn't always integrated with our geography. Singapore has citizenship in its nation state. Are the people of Singapore good residents in Southeast Asia? People tend to fight for a place in their nation to have a sense of seeking harmony with the home planet. They have to fight as citizens with political agendas. They want to claim that natural resources are national resources. We own the forest, we own the water. Well, Maybe what we're coming to is what? A sense of belonging on Earth in the future. Earth with an uppercase, Earth with a lowercase. Dirt, Earth, Earth, planet. Are we going to say that Earth is valueless except this planet we can manage in a way it's a marvelous planet you might say it's the most valuable thing of all because after all it sustains and produces all the earthbound values uh, we're thinking about the value of life as a creative process on earth or do we want to think of it asking 
what kind of planet do we want? What kind of planet can we get? Do we want to manage it in the light of our self-interest? Yes, there's real estate. Real estate is expensive, I'm sure, in this city. Uh, I own some earth. I own about a quarter of an acre of land. I once owned 1,200 acres of land inherited in the state of Alabama. And, you know, I thought I was the owner of that land. But when I switch it to a capital E, I may think I belong on that. Not so much that it belongs to me. On my campus, we don't want a student to get off campus, graduate, get off campus without being computer literate. And I bet you can't get off the Singapore Camp National University of Singapore campus without being computer literate. My campus, we also say, interestingly, isn't it? Also, the second thing, we don't want a student to leave my campus without being environmentally literate. Can you get off the NUS campus without being environmentally literate? I'm going to make you mad by saying I bet two-thirds of the students who leave are not environmentally deliberate. I'll be pleased to have that contested in a Q&A session uh, momentarily. Boutrous, Boutrous, Golly at the Rio conference. New mode of civic conduct. We've got to learn to love the world. We've got to have a contract with Earth. We speak often in ethics of a social contract. Now we want a contract with Earth. Well, that's politicians. That's uh, you've heard from a philosopher, and you know, let's listen to a rocket scientist, Ed Mitchell. Suddenly, in the most long motion, slow motion moments of immense majesty, a sparkling blue and white jewel. Laced with slowly swirling veils of white, rising like a small pearl in a thick sea of black mystery. Right? There's the future of environmental ethics, caring for this planet. I remember so vividly, says Michael Collins, an astronaut, when I looked back at my fragile home, a tiny outpost suspended in the black infinity. Earth is to be treasured and nurtured, something that must endure. You're looking at the future of environmental ethics. It's a lot bigger than the nation state of Singapore. A lot bigger than the United States of America. Environmental ethics is elevating an urgent world vision. Ethics adequate to respect life on Earth. That's the future of environmental ethics. And I think it is pivotal, central, on the world agenda. Thanks. Let's talk about it.
Well, there's a lot there, but uh, some of it must have raised a few thoughts in your head. Uh, would you speak up a bit? I'm not sure I hear you that well. Okay, um, just now you mentioned that our structures force frameworks of environmentally disruptive behaviors on the planet, right? So, um, what structural shifts do you suggest to orientate our priority to environmental concerns? sure that I sort of have a sound bite answer for that sort of question. Um, 